Did you know that Saturday, March 20th was the official International Day of Happiness? It's a day that's been celebrated since 2013 by the United Nations as a way to recognize the importance of happiness in the lives of people around the world. And it marks the release of the latest World Happiness Report, which ranks countries based on their citizens' well-being and the impact of various social, urban, and natural environments on their happiness. And how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. You likely spend a large portion of your life at work, so it's important that you find a position that meets your financial needs, but also meets your needs in other areas of life, such as flexibility, purpose, a sense of belonging, and more. As the world works through and recovers from the pandemic, we need to examine how we find happiness and well-being at work. So let's dive in to explore the drivers of work happiness and be sure to stick around until the end to learn how to find a job that makes you happy and how to be happier while finding a job. Here's what we'll cover in this workshop. Why happiness at work matters, understanding what makes you happy at work, how to find a company that meets your needs, and cultivating well-being in your job search and workplace. I'm excited to introduce our speakers today. Lisa is a career change coach, author, and founder of Career Clarity, a company helping individuals figure out the best next step in their career paths. My colleague Janine is also joining us today. She's the program lead for the Indeed Work Happiness Score and will be sharing new research for us to better understand what drives our happiness and well-being at work. And that's me, Brandy Warwas. I'm on Indeed's Job Seeker Experience team. We're responsible for creating helpful resources and events like this Jobcast for our users, like you. So why focus on well-being now? Well, we've been through a lot over the last year as we work to overcome a pandemic. Leading psychologists and well-being experts believe it's even more important to focus on well-being in times of transition and change. And when we say well-being and happiness, we don't mean just, you know, putting on a smile all day. It's really about whether you feel a sense of satisfaction and if you have more positive emotions on a given day. Well-being contributes to overall happiness, and happier people are more likely to be resilient, energetic, and innovative in times of great challenge or stress. And in case you haven't noticed, these are very stressful times. On top of that, we know career decisions like finding a new job are among the most stressful life decisions. So considering your happiness both in your new job and during your job search itself is important. Plus, you'll be more productive. Research by Dr. Jan Emanuel Deneuve, a globally recognized expert in employee well-being, shows that you're up to 20% more productive when you feel happier. And another expert we've worked with, Dr. Sonia Lubomirsky, says that research shows happier people experience more success, positive reviews, greater creativity, higher incomes, and less burnout. And for you job seekers, of course, happier people are more likely to get and keep jobs. We asked people that don't like something about their current job to tell us the primary reasons they'd consider new opportunities. Not being fairly paid was the top reason, followed by not feeling happy at work most of the time and not feeling energized. And when you're not happy at work, it impacts your life in meaningful ways. 84% of people report that how they feel at work affects how they feel at home. It's worth understanding how you're feeling at work to decide if you're in the right role with the right company or if it's time to make a change. So that begs the question, Janine, what makes us happy at work? Thanks, Brandy. This is a question that I love, and it's it's really one of the most simple questions, but it also is so, so complex and complicated. And over the last few years, Indeed has been studying this question in a really big way. We started digging into this question as well as what does it really mean for a workplace to be great? And how can Indeed help people get closer to a good life through their work. Right away, we knew we needed expert help and a lot of data to be able to answer these questions. So we found and partnered with some of the leading experts in work happiness, and we talked to thousands of job seekers and employers. 
throughout that process, one thing became really clear from all sides, which is how we feel at work matters and that people want and really need more from workplaces than they ever have before. So let's dive into those things now. Our expert partners in research helped us identify these 12 key drivers of work happiness. And you'll see some familiar things here like flexibility and fair pay, also feeling well-managed. But we also learned that there's new dimensions like belonging, inclusion, appreciation, a sense of purpose, um, feeling like you're energized by the work that you do on a day in and day out basis. These things really contribute to our well-being at work. And to put some of these things in practice, um, imagine a scenario where maybe you're entering the workforce for the first time. For someone in that position, being able to learn, feel supported, and having a really good manager is critical as they you know, enter the workforce and, and figure out what they're great at. Whereas maybe someone who is um, retired and looking for part-time work, they would really benefit from having uh, interactions with people and to feel that sense of belonging, feel maybe some appreciation, and to have a little bit of purpose they can go uh, into their days with. Or, you know, maybe you're looking for a new role right now and leaning more towards things that present stability for you, like pay, flexibility, and just really having a sense of trust. You know, like Brandy said, it has been a, a trying year. So having those things there for you um, would make absolute sense. You know, on the other side, maybe you're feeling stuck uh, and you really just are looking for new energy, new learnings. You want a new mission and purpose to be able to work towards um, so all of these dimensions can kind of ebb and flow over our careers and come into different importance um, for each of us as individuals. What I actually love most about these dimensions is they give us a new vocabulary for understanding what the things are that make us either love a job or hate a job. I know I've personally learned so much from understanding these dimensions to, to think about jobs I've had in the past and the ones that have been really great and why that is and others that, you know, I really wasn't happy or just like in general felt really like it wasn't a fit for me. And so these things have helped me find clarity and I hope that we can provide that to you all for you today. So understand once you understand what these dimensions are, then what you can do is really take small steps every day, every week to get a little bit happier at work. And even if it's just 1% better every day, that's still progress and growth. So once we knew what the drivers of work happiness were, we then wanted to know, is one of these more important than the other? And that's where things started to get really interesting. So we commissioned Forrester Research to conduct a study with over 5,000 employees. And what they said, was that things like paid fairly, flexibility, appreciation, those are the things that we think as people make us happy at work. And you know that's not surprising. Those are critical things that we need. But once we actually started to study this further, we saw something really interesting. What actually makes us happy at work is feeling energized, feeling a sense of belonging, feeling trust. And we think after looking at this, it made sense to us a little bit. You know, we think about fair pay and flexibility, like those are table stakes. Those are things we absolutely need. But then when we're actually in a job, the day-to-day -day is about what work you're doing, who you're doing it with, whether you can trust the people around you, do you feel that sense of purpose, you know, do you feel included, and so on. So we clearly saw that there's a big gap in what we think makes us happy at work versus what actually does. And it turns out there's a lot of other studies in the field of happiness that show a really similar trend. Just we as humans have a little bit of a hard time understanding what we do need. And that creates a gap in our thinking, which leads us to you know, our gaps in our decision-making sometimes as well. So for all the visual people watching right now, here's another way of, of thinking about this. Um, if you look at the bottom rungs, those are really our basic needs. So paid fairly, flexibility, being well-managed, uh, those are table stakes. But once we have those things met, what we benefit from in the workplace really starts to look a little different. And it gets into these, what we're calling elevated needs. So to really stay happy at work, we need to have strong social connections, a belief in what we do, to feel like we're really having a purpose that drives us um, in some small way or a big way and um, to feel like we are supported by people. So what we need from work 
is also influenced by how the world around us is changing. And this past year, we've seen some really interesting shifts. As we started to study our data even more, we saw that some dimensions come into special power in times of crisis. I think we all know that having a sense of belonging, having like trust for our work in our workplaces, that they're going to take our best interests in mind and do things to keep us safe. Having that flexibility, we need to like adapt and figure out how to adjust in the times that we're in um, and having that little bit of purpose that we can wake up and you know, tap into to find energy um, each day. So we know that these dimensions are going to continue to evolve over time and some will become more important while others maybe take a, a back seat, but Indeed is committed to staying really on the pulse of that and to being able to provide our research and learnings to job seekers um, for the foreseeable future. And we're really lucky to have Lisa here. She is going to dive deeper into how we can actually take these dimensions and their learnings and use them in our everyday lives. Thanks so much, Janine. It's great to be with you all today. I'm Lisa Lewis Miller. And the big question, once we take a look at important research findings like these is, how do I use these? How are these relevant in my own life? What does this mean for my personal well-being? And there are three different elements of that that we'll talk about in the remainder of our conversation today. First is understanding how to define and understand these for yourself. Second is thinking about the prioritization of them and the relative importance of each. And then third is strategizing on how to find these for yourself, whether you're finding them in your current situation, current employer, whether you're screening for them in future employers, and as Brandy stated at the very beginning of our conversation today, how to be integrating the factors that drive well-being even into your job search and job search activities to make sure that an activity that can feel challenging, stressful, and bring up lots of different emotions can feel as sustainable and as healthy as possible in the doing. So the first place to begin is in identifying your key happiness drivers. One of the really important things about this research and about this study is that when we're talking about well-being, it's a subjective measure. There's no singular objective way to say this is what well-being means and this is how you'll know if you've achieved it. So knowing that we have these 12 different dimensions, understanding how each of these resonate for you and what they mean for you and how you prioritize them will be a big, big question that will help you to then find what you're looking for on the other side. So asking yourself some of the questions that are within the work happiness study, like I am paid fairly at work. I feel appreciated as a person. I'm satisfied with my job. And the answers to those questions can reveal a lot to you about what you need most and what you're missing in your current situation. Now, if you would like to dive deeper into all of these questions and get a resource to support yourself in defining and prioritizing these for you, check this out. The Indeed team spent a ton of time and thoughtfulness on creating an incredible resource for you, a well-being at work worksheet and guide that you can pick up a copy of at go.indeed.com slash happiness dash guide to help you go deeper on each of these 12 dimensions for yourself and understanding and defining them. But what we'll do right now is go into those top three dimensions that Janine was mentioning just a moment ago and talk about some of the different ways in which these resonate for different individuals. So the first and most important area that came up in the Forrester research was that feeling energy at work is really important. Now, we can define that here as you may feel energy and energized in the day-to-day -day by the people that you interact with the work that you're doing, and the feelings that come up for you, whether you feel inspired, motivated, or challenged while staying fully absorbed. There are lots of different pieces to this. If you've ever heard of the term flow or feeling like you get lost in the work and lose track of time, that can be a great indicator that you're feeling energy and full engagement with your work. But as you can see in the data that we have here on what makes you feel energized at work, there's a bit of variation. So for some people, feeling excited about the work that they do is the most important factor to feeling energized. For other people, that flow state of being fully absorbed in the activities that you're engaged in is important. Sometimes it's when you feel inspired to do your best. It can also be when you feel challenged. For some people, challenge might absolutely increase your energy. And for other people, challenge might not be associated with energy. 
Other factors can include when you look forward to being in your work environment. So feeling like you're in an energizing space and with energizing people. And when you're inspired by the people around you, all of those can be important. So understanding and defining it for yourself will be really important for you. The next focus area that was the second highest one in the revealed preferences was the area of belonging. And belonging and inclusion both came up in this. So we'll talk about belonging, but know that there is a certain amount of overlap and cross-pollination that can happen across several of these. For a sense of belonging, you really want to feel like your company cares about you as a person. You want to feel like you have friends and collegiality at work. And you want to understand the impact that you have on other people and teams to see how you are one puzzle piece inside of the larger puzzle. Having meaningful connections beyond just over the work can be an incredibly important thing. And I'll say too that this is an even more important element to define for yourself through the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion because culturally we may have different needs or expectations about what belonging feels like and what feels good and what maybe we don't even want to get from our work. Feeling respected in your differences and values and seen and appreciated in that is important. And so is seeing people who look like you in leadership. So when you think about what makes you feel a sense of belonging, some of the most common answers that might be true for you are feeling like your company cares about you as a person, not just as a unit of human capital, having friends at work, understanding how you impact other people or teams within your organization, having conversations about things not related to work with my coworkers. Having the company values align with my personal values, being invited to important internal meetings, and being invited to informal social events outside of working hours. Now remember, just like we said, some of these might resonate for you, some of them might resonate a lot, some might not resonate at all, but understanding your core drivers of belonging and what you want most will make it easier to find it. Now let's talk about the last focus area for our conversation today. And if you want to, again, dive more deeply into any of these for yourselves, definitely check out the worksheet that the Indeed team put together for you. This focus area is trust. Trust is this feeling that you have your colleagues as people you can count on, people who respect you, people who are approachable and transparent, both at the leadership level and at the peer level. And understanding what makes you feel a sense of trust is a really important piece too. It's psychological safety. It's assuming positive intent. It's feeling like you're getting helpful feedback. It's feeling like there's transparency. Lots of levels. Are you trusted? Do you trust your team? Do you trust your supervisor? Do you trust leadership? Do you trust the organization writ large? There can be lots of overlap in the factors that create belonging and inclusion and trust. And I'll say too, if you are on the job hunt right now, it may be because your trust in your previous employer has been shaken up. And so looking for ways to find a place you could trust again and rebuild that kind of a feeling is incredibly important. So let's take a look at the data. What were some of the things that helped other people to feel a sense of trust? Feeling like you trust your coworkers as individuals rather than just as employees or coworkers was important. Feeling like my company sees me as a person rather than just an employee, also incredibly important. The ability to share my opinions safely with my manager and leaders, that psychological safety piece is huge. Feeling like most people that you work with are honest and have a positive intent is always a good thing too. Feeling like my company leaders are approachable and welcoming is something that has probably evolved a lot over the last 30, 40 years in the workplace and is something that people might not have even realized was important or was something that they were allowed to have decades ago. Clear communication and visibility into my performance and career path is important. Clarity on how decisions are made and transparency of company performance and health, especially in times like this when it feels easy to feel scared, nervous, or uncertain about an organization's future, all of these can potentially create a sense of trust. So noting which ones are most important to you will be a key piece in moving through finding a great fit employer and organization. You know, Lisa, I just wanted to jump in there for a second because as you mentioned, you know, having that transparency is is so important to having trust and you know, if you've ever been laid off, 
you you know how much having that trust shaken uh, can impact you and how that impacts how you value the dimension of trust in finding a new job. So your experiences definitely impact how you're you're valuing the different dimensions. Absolutely. Thanks for jumping in with that, Brandy. And Janine, I just realized I forgot to invite you to weigh in on any of those. Was there anything you wanted to add about those? Yeah. Uh, well, I think energy is the dimension that has really helped me the most recently. And one really simple way to understand your energy is to even just keep a log, a log of the things that you're doing every day, every week can be really simple. It doesn't have to be super detailed, but categorizing those things into the things you love and to things you loathe and really starting to see the difference between the two. Um, there's a book called Designing Your Life that, that showed me that exercise and it really helped open my eyes to what I feel good doing. And then really what are the things that you know drain me and starting to ask why those things are so draining um, and I think you're always going to have to find that balance, right? You're never going to be at a hundred percent in love with everything you do all day, uh, but you can at least maybe get 70%, 80%. Uh, so I think from an energy perspective, love that. Uh, and then belonging is so, so important. I am like a, a classic introvert. So this one's always hard for me to wrap my head around. You know, I want to make friends, but, you know, sometimes I am shy or, you know, I work really well independently too. Um, and I think as something that stood out to me from a coworker in the past was she actually created this great sense of belonging for us as a team. Um, she you would draw us all as superheroes, like as a team together with like different superpowers. And at the time, you know, it felt really good for all of us. But now looking back, you know, like it was such a big leadership move for her. Like she was creating a sense of belonging for all of us. And we kind of didn't really know it at the time, but those kinds of things can go a long way. Um, and, you know, like you said, Lisa, on that scale, looking at like, what are, how am I feeling today on these dimensions? If I do feel like I'm having a low day in terms of like belonging or connection, I think about, okay, what's one small thing I can do to uh, appreciate someone else or to give someone else a kudos? Like even doing that sort of act of kindness makes me then feel like I'm connected. So it all, it all kind of works together. I love that Janine. And it's actually a beautiful segue into the next part of our conversation today, which is how do you find a workplace that fosters your well-being, your sense of belonging, your sense of being energized, trust, all of those good things. And so some of the tactics that Janine just mentioned are perfect things to be thinking about if you're currently in an employment situation right now and you'd love to feel a little bit more well-being within that. So for those of you who are in that situation, here are some very tactical, practical tips that you can be implementing to be improving and increasing your well-being in the workplace right now. First and foremost, like we've been talking about a moment ago, asking yourself if a company is meeting your needs is exactly the place to start. Now, if you have identified what your needs are, what those are defined as for you, how you prioritize them, this then becomes a really easy kind of question. Am I feeling energized? Maybe on a, a yes, no, or a scale of one to 10. Am I feeling a sense of belonging? Because if you know where the gaps are and you know where things feel good, it will make it so much easier to address whether there are little micro changes that need to be made or if you're noticing some big macro level changes that need to be made. The next thing to think about is if you could join or start an employee resource group to help meet more of those needs. Maybe if it's a sense of belonging and inclusion, you can find an affinity group or start an affinity group within your organization to have more people with similar experiences getting together and also having more access to leadership. It could be that this would create more of a sense of trust for you because you have colleagues that you can share with in a different way or talk about different elements of your experience that might not be universal to all employees at the organization. Another thing to do, especially if appreciation is pretty high on your list of priorities for well-being, is to create a brag book for yourself. It can be so affirming and such a great boost of happiness to have a place where you have a record of all the previous times that you have gotten kudos or accolades so that you can look back on those and remember, okay, these are the things that I'm great at. These are the things that energize me. These are the things that other people see and notice in me that feel so meaningful and valuable to me. It can be a great way to have a bit of a life raft 
for yourself, especially if you're having a really tricky day. Another way to increase your well being in the workplace is to align tasks to your strengths. All of the data says that when you get to work in an area of strength, and this isn't just an area of capability, it's an area of energy, right? That number one driver of well being, you tend to be happier at work. You tend to have more longevity at work. You tend to get into flow states more often. So if there's a way that you can be creative with your tasks to align them with areas that you already get that natural energy in your strengths, it can also help to increase your well-being on a day-to-day level. And of course, the last thing to do is to talk to your manager. Beginning an open conversation and a dialogue around the factors that contribute to your well-being is so important to get them met. If your manager doesn't know what factors contribute to your well-being, they can't very well be responsible for any gaps that you have in meeting them. So beginning that conversation and making sure that your manager understands the ways in which your well-being can be improved by some of those micro or macro level changes can be a huge tool in your toolbox for feeling more of the way that you want to feel at work day to day in your current situation. Now, If you've been assessing your own workplace satisfaction, happiness, and well-being, and you recognize that it would be really difficult to meet your needs within your current organization, or if you're already on the job search and starting to look for new places to go, you understand how important it is to screen an employer for values and for alignment. So it also can feel pretty tricky to understand how you can assess those things from the outside of an organization but these are some great tactics and tips to allow for you to have a little bit more of a line of sight into what a company is really like once you get inside. The first place to look is at an organization's vision and mission statement. What do they put externally as the things that they value or as the things that they are trying to uphold as a company? Even though we know that sometimes that can be shiny, glossy, polished corporate jargon, If they put it on their website, it's at least an indication that that's what they strive for if they're not able to achieve it every single day. If an organization doesn't have a vision vision or a mission statement stated, that might also be really interesting, helpful information for you as well. Another place to screen your organization for their values is on social media. When you look at social media, you can actually look at it at the level of if they are walking their talk, essentially through a couple different levels. Number one, organizations are putting out a lot of brand or company level social media. So checking and seeing what they share and why, but then also looking at the employees at that organization and what they put out on social media can be telling as well. Do they tend to talk about having a lot of really good days or talk about some of the interesting team building things that they're doing at the organization? Or do none of them really seem to post about the organization? Some companies may have a policy that you can't post about anything at work, But it's worth looking just to see what's there, to see if there might be some helpful data points or breadcrumbs for you. And of course, looking at how the customers talk about a brand on social media can be really helpful too. If you're seeing lots of happy customers and lots of elated posts, that can be a really good sign. And noticing if you're seeing a lot of frustrated customer posts can also be a really important data point to use in your decision making. And of course, Asking the employees, whether you're looking at employee reviews somewhere that is external, that's a little bit more anonymized, uh, like what you can find on Indeed, or actually getting the opportunity to talk to employees one-on-one and ask them those questions and the follow-up questions to really help you to understand an organization can be great. There's only so much that we can pick up about an organization when we're looking at external resources and getting to dive into the nuance and really understand what it's like to be at an organization and some of the pros and cons that may not necessarily come across in external reviews can be really important too. So initiating conversations with employees at the organization is a really helpful tip. But if you don't have an opportunity to do that outside of an interview, So in more of an informational interview style situation, you can always ask questions during the interview process to suss this out as well. It's great to ask questions like, how does your organization support employees who are going through challenging times? Or how has your organization supported employees through COVID to understand how they really walk their talk? And if they are revealing that they do the activities that will create the feelings that you're looking for on your own personal path towards well being. And if you want to understand more about how to see an organization's uh, well being factors, 
Indeed has this fabulous work happiness score metric that you can look at. There have been 5 million happiness surveys that have already been taken and counting. And there's a new set of data on the website that is the largest study of workplace happiness developed with the guidance of leading happiness experts. It is a wonderful place to go and see exactly how folks are talking about the ability to access happiness at work in the way that matters most for them. So absolutely go check out the work happiness score. And Janine, I'm wondering if you want to jump in and say any more about how to use the work happiness score. Absolutely. The work happiness score is a section that is on the Indeed Company Pages platform. So for almost every company in the world, we have a company page where people go and leave reviews and ratings about what it's like to work there. And we have all sorts of data ranging from salary data to questions and answers about how interviews work there, uh, as well as the long form reviews that you'd expect as well. Work happiness is a new data set that we've added because when we talked to job seekers, we learned three things that they're often balancing when you're making decisions are, does this job have the flexibility I need? Am I going to be paid fairly? And am I going to be happy there? And it's happiness is, and well-being are really, you know, it's an intangible thing. It's really hard to measure. And we wanted to provide job seekers at least a more transparent and clear way to help them understand how people are feeling in that workplace. And I think it's a great tool to use when you're researching companies, while you're interviewing, you know, all throughout your job process to get a sense of how a company is performing. And I think we see companies in every single industry that are really, really happy. And we see a lot of companies that are average and that's okay too. So it's a really good tool to hopefully guide you to understanding those things. And, and like we said, if there are dimensions that you know are really important to you, you can look for those specific dimensions on the work happiness score and see how that company is performing. Now let's talk about cultivating well-being in your job search. This one can feel hard because looking for a job can feel like a full-time job in and of itself. But when you're looking for a job, you are the person who's primarily responsible for your own well-being. So knowing what drives your well-being and taking the tactical, practical steps to preserve it is incredibly important. And here we'll go into some of the ways that we've outlined some specific action steps that you can take to take care of and cultivate a sense of well-being, even when you are looking for what's next out there. So the first place to start is, of course, with energy, that top dimension. When you are engaging in your job search, ask yourself a question like, what inspires you during your day? And how can you give yourself opportunities to be re-energized during your job search? It can definitely not feel great to be looking at job postings for eight hours a day, five days a week. So give yourself some energy and inspiration breaks to punctuate your day so that you can feel as energized as possible when you are putting forward that effort towards cultivating a relationship with a potential future employer. Next, let's look at the well-being factor of achievement. When you are on the job search, it can sometimes feel like a slog and that it's hard to see any measurable progress. So ask yourself how you can celebrate small wins along the way. I am a big fan of incentives and of treating yourself. So for you, it might be, okay, after I've submitted three job applications this week, I am going to make myself my favorite hot beverage. Maybe after I have spent an hour customizing my resume and cover letter for this particular opportunity, I'm going to give myself permission to go for an hour-long walk in the sun and just stretch my legs and not be anywhere near a screen or a computer during that time. Figure out what some of those micro steps are that contribute to successfully landing a job and give yourself permission to note those and celebrate those along the way to feel more of that sense of energy and sustainability as you go. Another factor is learning. And so many people are motivated by learning, challenge, growth, opportunities to stretch in new ways. And the job search presents a fabulous time to lean into learning because so often when we are on the prowl, we're looking for roles that give us challenges that we haven't taken on before. 
And sometimes that'll cause us to have gaps in our skill set or areas where we may not have all of the training and all of the tools that an employer might be looking for just yet. So ask yourself as you're going through your job search, what new skills can you add to your resume through free or low cost affordable online trainings? Because not only will you get to lean into learning and growth and finding yourself being intellectually challenged, but you'll also be adding some really nice accolades that may have a spot on your resume or on any of your job seeker profiles to show off why you're an even more qualified candidate. It's a great two for one. Support. It can feel so lonely and so isolating to be on the job search. So surrounding yourself with a sense of support and encouragement is so important. So one of the best things to do is to get somebody in your corner. It could be a coach. It could be a friend. It could be a a member of a religious community that you're a part of. It could be a family member. But finding a confidant who can encourage you, who is positive, who you can check in regularly with, and tying back to that sense of achievement, who may also help you to celebrate your incremental progress and incremental victories, can be so pivotal to feeling Like you're not doing this alone, you're not an island, and that you've got the stamina and the grit to be able to get through the job search and come out on the other side where you want to be. That sense of belonging is incredibly important too. And to that same point of it feeling really isolating and lonely to be on the job search, you can look for groups and communities to join that will help you to feel like there are other people going through the same thing other people who think the same way that you do. So asking yourself, is there a group you can join to further your community, your career and provide community can be great. It might be a group that's related to your geography. So job seekers in your city. It could be a group that is related to an affinity that you have. You know, Even if it's a book club, things like that can be really helpful in cultivating that sense of community and connection. And of course, it can be a community that is directly related to your particular job function. So much of the best networking and relationship building that ultimately opens the doors that allows for interviews and hiring to happen happens in some of these micro communities like project management communities or engineering communities, things like that. So if you haven't already, take some time to look for any particularly online in this season communities that you could join to be surrounded by fellow practitioners that can help you to have that sense of belonging and may also increase the kind of outcomes and results you're getting from your job search activities. Purpose, a sense of purpose and meaning and mission is so important. And this one can come across in a lot of different ways as you're taking care of your well being in your search. One of the best ways related to learning, like we talked about earlier, is finding ways to help people, finding ways to allow for your skills and gifts to make a difference in somebody else's life. So the question here, which is such a great one, is would volunteering help make you feel impactful and connected to a sense of community and purpose? And can it do double duty and contribute to your resume as a line item that you can add under volunteer experience, leadership experience, training, pro bono work, anything else that you might include so that you become not only a better qualified and better connected candidate, but you also get some really great sense of contribution along the way. Flexibility. Now, when you think about job searching, and we talk about it as being a full-time job in and of itself, it can feel really tempting to have to put four, five, six hours towards this every single day to feel like you're getting any traction. But sometimes that kind of a rigidity to your time and to your schedule can make it feel really draining and have it wear on you and wear away at your sense of persistence and grit. So one of my favorite questions to ask around flexibility is, Can you schedule job searching into your day so that it doesn't bleed into the rest of your day and the rest of your life? Can you make it time bound? Can you take the concept of chunking where you take uh, or batching where you take similar types of activities like updating your resume or searching for things and do them all at the same time with a timer on so that you can feel like you'll be efficient doing things as quickly as you're able to while getting the quality and caliber that you need to and without it expanding to fill up all of your available time. 
having that sense of flexibility and boundaries on the way that you're using your energy and time can be great in preserving your well being. And last but not least, appreciation. Utilizing a brag book of positive feedback, kind of like we were talking about before, just to remind yourself that you're capable, you're creative, your work is valued and appreciated, that you do good stuff out there in the world can be so helpful, especially for those of you who may be laid off or in between jobs and feel like it's been a while since you've actually received that kind of feedback personally and verbally. Having a reference point that you can go to to look at is so helpful. I know for myself personally, I call this my yay file. It is a Google Doc where I just copy and paste in any accolades or feedback that I've gotten in the past that when I'm having a really tough day can be the thing that I go back to to remind myself that, okay, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to land somehow. I'm enough. My work is worthy. I will find some place that feels like a good fit. And with that, I will toss the mic back to Brandy to recap and close us out. Okay, so I know that was a lot of information. So let's recap with your action items. First, focus on work well-being now, because if you're happier, you will be more productive, successful, and able to deal with the stresses of today. Understand the drivers of work happiness, both the basic and elevated needs. Think about which drivers you value the most and how you prioritize them for yourself. Consider whether your current job is satisfying those needs, and if not, use tools like the Work Happiness Score on Indeed to identify companies that might be a better fit for you. And finally, cultivate your well-being during the job search by finding ways to tap into those happiness drivers. We at Indeed have also created lots of great resources that we'll continue to build on, and you can find them at go.indeed.com forward slash happiness. We just launched expert videos on with happiness experts around purpose and um, job crafting, which I think is a really great tool if, if you are in a role where you're not really feeling energized or finding like it's a fit. There's a very interesting concept called job crafting, um, social connections, purpose. Uh, So feel free to visit that. We'll continue to post all of our updated research on this landing page. And you can also have a direct link there to take the work happiness survey. By taking the work happiness survey, you are then contributing to helping other people understand what it's like to work in your workplace and helping them find more happiness as well. And I'll say a big thank you to the Indeed team for inviting me to come on and talk about well-being and happiness in the workplace. It is something that I am obsessed with and a big champion of because there are almost always ways to feel better in your work. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, Again, I'm Lisa Lewis Miller, uh, and you can find out more information about the work that I do at getcareerclarity.com. So now let's take a look at some of the top questions that came in. So let's jump in. The first question that was upvoted here is, when battling burnout, what are some steps to maintain a positive attitude? This is a great question. And I'll jump in. And Janine, if you want to to piggyback on, please let me know. So when battling burnout, typically burnout is a, a symptom of overgiving, of having done so much, put in so many hours, given so much of your energy, your time your mental bandwidth, that you just feel like you've got no more gas left in the tank. And if there is a time in your life that you need to be thinking about factors for well-being, it is absolutely when you're battling burnout. One of the biggest things that I encourage folks to do when they're battling burnout is to start with really, really small steps. So for example, if you find that one of your biggest factors towards well-being is feeling appreciated and you feel like you haven't been appreciated at all within your current situation, but that asking your manager to give you feedback or to give you that sense of encouragement that you're looking for feels too big or too arduous or like it would take too much energy. Starting with something really, really small and a baby step is a great thing to do. It might just be reminding yourself of someone who gave you a compliment in a previous role or a fellow coworker on a different project. It could be going back through past work emails or past project emails to find one that says, good job. 
even something like that can remind you that, hey, okay, my work is meaningful. I'm doing good stuff. This is appreciated. And even if it's not appreciated in my current situation, it is worthy, important, valuable work. So finding baby steps and ways to be really gentle and starting small is the biggest advice that I can give you for battling burnout to help you get back to that positive attitude, right? Because there's no way to just try to flip a switch in your brain and say, I'm just going to be positive about this now. It's got to be natural. It's got to be authentic. It's got to come from within. So starting yourself with tiny steps to recultivate that and retap into that is really important. Janine, anything to add? Yeah, I wanted to add that I think with all of these dimensions, there's things that are within your control and things that really need to change within your environment. So I often try to think, okay, what can I personally control in this moment, in this scenario, and start there. Um, I I think also communicating to your manager how you are feeling um, when it gets to the point where like really need them to hear you, like using some of these words and having this vocabulary to actually speak about it, I think is really valuable. Uh, Sometime last year, I told my manager that I was my well-being at work was suffering. And I think it's a lot different than saying like, I'm not feeling happy at work, right? Like it's so much more to say, like I really am struggling in a way that's like really impacting my life. And how can we work together to figure out what the causes are, how we might be able to prevent it. Um, So having that relationship is really great. And if you don't have that relationship, at least having that that conversation with yourself uh, and really taking the space to get space Um, when I was struggling with that, I would feel like my like energy bar was like at a hundred percent at like 10 AM and I had to go the rest of the day and figure out how do I kind of like fight through these feelings. Um, and really what, what helps the most is like getting out of the house, going out in nature, seeing the bigger picture, tapping into like what motivates you to work at all. Um, and just trying to use some of those tools and, and baby steps, like Lisa said. Thanks Janine and Lisa. Uh, The next question here is, how do you balance salary needs and happiness? This is a great question because just like you saw in the data, uh, compensation and fair pay is a big driver of happiness. But one of the interesting things about the data is that there are those 12 factors that are drivers of well-being and happiness in the workplace, and compensation is one of them. So I am a big believer that your compensation and the other factors of happiness don't have to be mutually exclusive and competitive. So step number one is understanding what you prioritize and what you need most among those 12 factors. In terms of your compensation and salary, where do you need to be? Where's the floor of you can't make any less than this, otherwise you are going to be deeply unhappy and not have your needs met? Where's your target range, the place that you'd ideally like to be, that's a little bit of a step up from where you are right now, And then what would be your jump for joy number can be a really helpful mental frame to see the space that you want to be looking in. And then from there, you can look at the other factors that contribute to your happiness and prioritize them to say, okay, out of all the other things that I could have, what do I need most to feel like I'm getting a really lovely holistic sense of well-being from my workplace? Then Your mission is to go through your job search, holding those up as your highest priorities and screening for them effectively using some of the wonderful tools that we've been talking about today, like the work happiness score that you can see on Indeed profiles for employers, doing research into what employees say about an organization, other factors like that. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that this is, this is really what drove us to create the work happiness score is this, this constant balance of fair pay, flexibility, and actually wanting to enjoy your day. And I think it is a sense of trade-off, right? Like how much are you willing to give for what you're going to get from your employer in return? And it might be that pay is one of those things that an employer can give you, but employers can give you other things as well that I think tip those scales in different different ways. And, And I think always checking in on that and making sure that you are feeling good and Definitely having your basic needs met would be an ultimate priority. Uh, and like I said, there, there are work happiness scores for every single industry and for every single job. And there are there is happiness to be found in, in all the industries. Yeah, and I'd add there just that, you know, thinking back to that pyramid 
uh, the hierarchy with the basic needs and elevated needs, those basic needs around um, pay and flexibility, those tend to be things that we are looking for specifically during the job search and we will ask about specifically and, and get to know that before we actually accept the job. But those more elevated needs are harder to find out if they'll be met until you actually get in the job itself. So keeping that in mind, you wanna make sure that you're asking the right questions during the interview and doing that research to, to find out you know, how those elevated needs will be met in whatever new job you're, you're applying to. So the next question here is, I love my job, but the people I work with, not so much. Now that we've been working from home, it's been much more enjoyable, and I'm not looking forward to going back into the office. Should I find another job, or do you have any other suggestions? It's another great question, and I think it brings up, again, this subjective well-being and how you prioritize the different pieces of it. I think the question really comes down to how important is belonging to you? If belonging feels like the most important priority, a non-negotiable value, it might be worth thinking about making a switch into another job where you would have more of a sense that you really appreciate, respect, and trust the people that you work with. But if belonging is not the most important priority for you, and you feel like there might be a way to continue on in this job that, that you said that you love in a way where making some trade-offs on belonging would still feel good and still allow you to have happiness, you may absolutely be able to be creative and get negotiable with your employer and with your team on potentially working into the future in a partially remote or fully remote way. And you may be able to find those belonging needs met in other ways, like we talked about with an employee resource group or even having belonging met with people outside of your team or outside of your department. So it's a great question, and it really highlights why thinking about this on a personal prioritization level is so important. I imagine some of you who are here with us live are thinking, no way, if I didn't like the people that I work with, I would definitely need to leave and find a new opportunity. And that's fabulous clarity. And there may be some of you who are here who are thinking, you know, if I didn't love the people I was working with, that would kind of be okay with me if some of my other happiness and well-being needs are being met. So it's a great discernment question for you, and there are lots of paths forward that may allow for you to feel like you're getting your belonging needs met, whatever degree of importance they are. I just wanted to add, too, that it has been great to have some, some things come out of the pandemic that have been good, like being able to work from home, like you mentioned. And I don't know, maybe your coworkers learned a little bit in the past year, and you know, everyone's done some soul searching, and, and who knows, maybe when people do go back to the office... There's other ways to connect that you may not have thought of in the past. Uh, and I would, I would also add that if you're not getting the belonging from work, it, it would feel important to have that coming from somewhere. So having a group outside of work, whether that's like an art class or, you know, a volunteer opportunity or being around family and friends often, um, I think you could probably get away with it in that sense if you, if you had belonging coming from another aspect. Very true. We don't need to rely on just our core team at work for all of these um, important dimensions of happiness. So I think we have time for one more question, um, and we'll do, for people job hunting, what questions can you ask your interviewer that reveal what kind of environment you're entering? And also, how would you examine the answers that would raise red flags? Lisa, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, it's very perceptive to be asking that question of how do I take care of myself and protect myself in the interview process? And I'm a big fan of a somewhat untraditional tactic, which is that when you get to the point in the interview where the interviewer says to you, you know, well, what questions do you have for us? I am a big believer that using a behaviorally structured or a situationally structured question and posing it to them can be so effective. So if you've ever encountered a, an interviewer asking you a question that starts with, tell us about a time when you can use it exactly in that same format, asking back. So tell me about a time when there was conflict within this team. How was it resolved? Can give you lots of great data points that are based on a past experience that actually happened about how an organization thinks about and prioritizes trust belonging, inclusion, appreciation, all of those factors. 
So thinking about what's most important to you, what in that subjective well-being is your highest value, and then structuring a question to ask them to give you an example where they've actually interacted with that particular element can be a great way to do some due diligence and make sure that they're really walking their talk before you say yes to accepting an offer. Janine, anything to add there? That's a really great point. I think how people answer that question is definitely more helpful than kind of some of the what's it like to work here, open-ended questions. Getting more specific will definitely get you more specifics. Um, I also think having a little bit of clarity around what you're, what you are looking for and what your strengths are. I find that if you have kind of like your little map of like, here's who I am, here's what I care about and have that kind of built in confidence for what you are looking for in a job. I think people will be able to kind of give you more answers on those things. And so I guess it all, it all starts with clarity. And I think Lisa had a great point of asking questions where you're going to get a tangible answer and example. Yeah. And I think that the question you ask also depends on who you're interviewing with. So if you're talking to the um, recruiter for a company, you might want to ask questions about, you know, the company leadership or um, employee resource groups, that sort of thing. Um, But if you're talking to the hiring manager, you can ask things like, how would you describe your management style? You know, things that will get more into you know, helping you decide whether or not it's the right fit to what you need for manager support, for example. So I know we are at time. So if you found this to be helpful, check out our other job casts at indeed.com slash job cast and follow Indeed on social media. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment below. Thanks for watching.